All right, hello everyone. Today we are reading the memoirs of the conquistador Bernal Diaz del Castillo, written by himself. Today we are only reading an excerpt from his memoir, which is just a portion, and we aren't even reading a full chapter. It's actually just a part of chapter six from his personal memoir. So this is an absolute true story written by Bernal Diaz del Castillo himself. This excerpt is about how 20 of us went on shore in the Bay of Florida with the pilot, Alaminos, in search of water. The hostilities which the natives of this country commenced with us and all of all, of all that further befell us on our passage to the Havana. Okay, so before we get started really quickly, please just realize the pilot Alaminos, okay, the pilot's name is Alaminos. We're going to hear a lot about him here at the beginning of the memoir. All right, so here we go. Let's take it away. As soon as we had arrived off the coast of Florida, we determined that 20 of our men who had almost recovered from their wounds should go on shore. Among the number was myself and the pilot, Alaminos. We each took a mattock and a small cask, being, moreover, well armed with crossbows and muskets. Our captain, who was dangerously wounded and very much weakened by the extreme thirst he suffered, begged of us, in the name of God, to bring him some sweet water. As he was almost dying of thirst, indeed, the water, as I have before said, which we then had, was quite salty and not drinkable. We landed in a creek, and our pilot again recognized this coast, which he had visited ten or twelve years previously with Ponce de Leon, when he discovered these countries. They had here fought a battle with the natives and lost many of their men. We therefore took every precaution, lest the natives should also fall upon us unawares. We posted two sentinels at a spot where the stream had a considerable breadth. We then dug deep wells where we thought fresh water was likely to be found. The sea was just ebbing, and it pleased God that we should find sweet water there. All right, so we've just finished up the first two paragraphs. Obviously, um, we have Bernal, our main character. He is the um, protagonist of the story, right? He is the one that is telling this story from first person point of view. And he is basically explaining to us, obviously, their captain is basically dying of thirst at this point. And so he and some of his other men are on a search for fresh water. They can't drink the salt water from the ocean, and so therefore they have have to go ashore. However, they know that the place where they are um, is very, very dangerous, okay? And so he says, we posted two sentinels, which is uh, like two watchmen, all right? So two guys to kind of watch the area, make sure that nobody comes after them, okay? So they're definitely, like he said, taking every precaution here and trying to be very, very careful. This is good. With joyful hearts, we then took our fill of the refreshing beverage and washed the bandages of our wounded. A good hour's time was spent in this, and as we were on the point of re-embarking with the casks of water, quite overjoyed at our success, one of the men whom we had placed sentinel on the coast came running towards us in all haste, crying aloud, Two arms! Two arms! Numbers of Indians are approaching, both by land and sea. And indeed, the Indians came up to us almost at the same time with the sentinel. Okay, so this is not good. We've just finally got fresh water. We've clean, we've cleansed our wounds. We're taking the water back to the wounded soldiers. And what happens? The Indians are here. And so now we don't know what's going to happen, but we can make some inferences here, right? My guess is things probably aren't going to turn out very good for Bernal. 
They had immense sized bows with sharp arrows, lances, and spears. Among these, some were shaped like swords, while their large, powerful bodies were covered with skins of wild beasts. They made straight ways to us, let fly their arrows, and wounded six of our men at the first onset. I was also slightly wounded in my right arm. We, however, received our enemies with such well-directed blows and musket shots that they were very soon quitted us, who had been digging the wells, and turned towards the creek to assist their companions, who, in their canoes, were attacking those left behind in the boat. The latter had been forced to fight man to man, and had already lost the boat, which the Indians were towing off behind their canoes. Four of the sailors had been wounded, and the pilot, Alaminos himself, severely so in the throat. We, however, courageously faced our enemy, went up to our middles in the water, and soon compelled them, by dint of our swords, to jump out of the boat again. Twenty-two of the enemy lay dead on the shore. Three others, who were slightly wounded, we took on board with us, but they died soon after. All right, so this is actually, you know, things didn't go as bad as they could have, right? Um, Bernal and the other men that were on shore actually came out victorious, and they have survived. Now, some of their men were killed. However, um, they did defeat the Indians that tried to attack them. So this is a good thing. However, we have to remember that the men that were on the boat were already very sick, about to die from a lack of water. And so now we have to see how these guys, guys are doing. After this skirmish was ended, we questioned the soldier who had stood sentinel as to what had become of his companion, Barrio. He related that his comrade had left him with an axe in his hand in order to go out and cut down a palm tree, and that this was near the inlet where the Indians first made their appearance. He had also heard him cry out in Spanish, upon which he himself had immediately hastened to give us the information. His companion, no doubt, had been murdered by the Indians. Singular that this man should have lost his life here, he being the only one who escaped without a wound at the Battle of Potenchon. We made every search for him and followed the track of the Indians who had just attacked us. This indeed led us to a palm tree which had been recently cut, around which were numerous footmarks. We could, however, discover no marks of blood, and concluded, therefore, that the Indians had carried off the man alive. After we had fruitlessly searched for him in every quarter for upwards of an hour, and repeatedly called aloud to him without receiving any answer, we returned to our boat and brought the water on board. The joy of our men was as great as if we had brought them new life, and one of the soldiers, from excessive, thir excessive thirst, leaped from the vessel into the boat, seized one of the small casks, and poured such an abundance of water into his body that he instantaneously swelled out and expired. Okay, so right here. This is kind of an important part, okay? To swell out and expire, you guys. What does it mean to expire, right? It means to go bad. This man has just almost basically flooded his organs with water, okay? They were used to being dehydrated. He goes and he chugs all of this water and he literally kills himself from drinking too much water. <clears throat> Having brought the water on board our vessels, hauled in our boats, we hoisted our sails and stood direct for the Havana. The day and following night, the weather was most beautiful as we passed the martyr islands and sandbanks of the same name. We had only four fathoms water. Where the sea was deepest, our principal ship consequently st struck against the rocks and became very leaky so that all hands were engaged at the pumps, without then being able to get to the water under, while we every moment feared the vessel would go down. I 
never shall forget the answer which some sailors from the Levant, who were among the crew, made when we cried out to them, Come on, my boys, help us to pump out the water, or we shall all be lost. You see how our wounds and our hard labor have debilitated us. That's your own out lookout, they said they. We get no pay, suffer both from hunger and thirst, and have in the bargain to share your fatigues and wounds. Nothing now remained but to drive them to the pumps by main force, and in this way, we had alternately to work the sails and the pumps, however distasteful to us, until the Lord Jesus brought us into the port of Corinna, where now the town of Havana stands, the latter being previously called Porta de Corinnas and not the Havana. As soon as we had set foot on shore, we returned thanks to the Almighty for our safe return and got the water out of our principal ship, in which a Portuguese diver, who happened to be on board another vessel, greatly assisted us. We also immediately wrote to the governor, Diego Velasquez, giving him an account of the countries we discovered with large townships and houses built of stone, whose inhabitants were clad in cotton and wore maltates, likewise of the gold and the regular maize, plant plantations of the country. Our captain journeyed over land to Santa Spiritus, where he and his in Indian com commandary he died, however, ten days after his arrival there from his wounds. The rest of our men became dispersed through the island, and three more of our men died of their wounds at the Havana. Okay, so after everything they did for their captain, they finally get to shore. They finally return home. And what happens just three days after his return, or I'm sorry, just ten days after their return there, he dies. Almost done. Just a little more, guys. Our vessels were taken to Santiago de Cuba, where the governor resided. Here, the two Indians were brought on shore, whom we had taken with us from the Punta de Catoche, as above related, called Melicario and Julianio. When, however, we brought forth the box with the crowns, the golden ducks, the fish, and the idols, more noise was made about them than they really merited, so that they became the common topics of conversation throughout the islands of St. Domingo and Cuba. Indeed, the fame thereof even reached Spain. Okay, so all of these things they bring back from the islands that they have seen, right? And people just go crazy over it. They think how amazing this is. Now, but are the people on the island that were already there, they did not go on this journey, are they really concerned about what it took to get there, what they, you know, all had to go through, right? They watched their men die of thirst. They watched their men get killed by Indians, right? This was a very, very difficult journey. And it's kind of like everybody's just forgetting that. All they care about is what they brought back. There it was said that none of the countries which had hitherto been discovered were as rich as this. And in none had there been found houses built of stone. The earthen gods, it was said, were the remains of the ancient heathen times. Others again went so far as to affirm that they were descendants of the Jews whom Titus and Vespasian had driven from Jerusalem, who had been shipwrecked off this coast. Peru, indeed, was not then known, and in so far the countries we had discovered were justly considered of the greatest importance. Diego Velasquez closely questioned the two Indians, and these are the two Indians that remember that they were that they had a battle against, right? Uh, they took them in their boat with them and they brought them back to their home. So now these Indians are being questioned. Diego Velasquez closely questioned the two Indians as to whether there were any gold mines in their country. They answered in the affirmative. And what does the affirmative mean, you guys? Remember, we can always go down here and see. Yes, this is true. There are gold mines on the island that they were on. 
And when they were shown some of the gold dust found in the island of Cuba, they said there was an abundance of it in their country. And this they told an untruth, as it is very well known, there are neither gold mines on the Punta de Catoche, nor even in whole Yucatan. In this beautiful voyage of discovery, we had spent our all and returned to Cuba covered with wounds and as poor as beggars. Yet we had reason to congratulate ourselves that it had not been equally disastrous to us all as to many of our companions who had lost their lives. Our captain, as I have already mentioned, died soon after his return and all of us suffered for a considerable time after from our wounds. Our whole loss amounted to 70 men, which was all we had gained by this voyage of discovery.